So before jumping into the hardcore topics, mm -hmm. I think Natalie will be nice to s introduce you a little bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. We just select a few images that can talk a little bit about our background, so you will get a little bit guide about it. So Natalie. I just received this from you. Okay. So I'm an architect and also um, in architecture theory. So I researched. This was my um, PhD. It was on data centers and the cloud. So the cloud is kind of like a metaphor that was um, for our archives. So I was interested in that. You can just kind of yeah. click through it. And then uh, just as um so I was interested in objects that could kind of deal with the cloud and um, rocks. So I think the next one, this is a cloud fountain. Here are rocking rocks. They're chairs that have been kind of reanimated because also rocks used to be alive. You can there was a performance there or what? Uh, this was for an artist talk also. Okay. Then um, some exhibition architectures. So in the summer we did this show um, where we built a kind of mass station um, that's still yeah. work in progress. And then this is the sausage sofa, which I built some years ago, <laughs> which actually had <laughs> pretty good feedback. Um, yeah, so that, and I do some more normal architecture projects also. <laughs> yeah, before jumping in your image, Robert, I want to say that uh, you wrote the text for, yeah. for the booklet that you might find it on the entrance. Mm -hmm. So I would totally recommend it to really dive into this because it's pretty much something that helped us a lot to understand what we potentially been flying through this project. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much and, mm -hmm. and now your image, Robert. I'm looking forward to hear about this. Um, yep, hi, uh, Robert Lebock. Uh, I, I think you stepped through my artistic history in like uh, fast forward. This is a, um, my first stage design I done for Sebastian Baumgarten, 1994. Uh, um, Andere Räume, music by uh, Mala and Janacek. Why you show it uh, could be which you didn't know, but the holes are like uh, entrance for uh, for actors. So there's already like an in-between situation, being outside uh, the stage, being inside the stage. I love skulls. I still love skulls. I do a lot with I know, them. I know. <laughs> but I thought it was some lights, but there are actually holes yep. on the. Okay. Yeah, they're black black holes, and you. Uh, we we had a, a choir like. Uh, for women and they could like appear in the holes and go away. They were like they were like giving giving things to the to the actors and then disappearing again. Okay. Next one. Urest, komische Opa, stage design I done and yeah just stage design I done with my brother Ronald together. Interesting uh, in this uh, Topic here is that we were taking care a lot of the acoustics, so the, the the ceiling of the stage was movable, so we could like change the reflections of the instruments, and we decided to put the baroque orchestra uh, on stage uh, behind the singers, so uh, the orchestra mixes very nice, but also very direct uh, with uh, with the voices. Schönheit und Vergänglichkeit. Uh, uh, I, I just made music for uh, um, this documentary film uh, about three characters from uh, from the East. Uh, one is uh, easy recognizable, uh, Sven Marquardt, a photographer. Um, a film about uh, visions and uh, alternatives, uh, alternative lives uh, in 2020, where people uh, live their dream, even though the dreams are weird, but uh, they don't, don't care so much about yeah. the capitalist world. This one, I think, is the one that I'm more interested in. I have a few questions, but maybe listen to you. Uh, this is a piece I uh, done for uh, CTM. That's my uh, recent, uh, or the most recent work I've done. Uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a system which feeds itself, so you have a, a, a modules, uh, some of you know modular synthesizers. I had only modules which uh, uh, made no sounds, uh, uh, but they were creating signals to trigger percussion loops. This yellow 
uh, vase which looks like 70s uh, uh, kind of thing uh, we specially made for this installation. Maybe you can show the next picture. This is in, in the process of making and it was like it, it, it was like being in heaven or and hell because this it was a big lump of uh, liquid glass and they had three people had to work on this form and they were constantly moving it and blowing blowing it up but tried to hold it down because otherwise the form gets like uh, it was here in Berlin? Internal, yeah, the, uh, um, a glass art, it's called uh, uh, Natja Irdis, uh, is the head of the uh, uh, workshop. Okay. Constanza Makras, Volksbühne, uh, music for a dance piece. Uh, I love to work with Constanza because she leaves me totally free in working, which is can be also a spatial thing because I, sometimes I fill the room completely with distortion and uh, she was fine with it. I just missed the headline. But I what also, what the hell is that? The, no, you sent me that. <laughs> uh, I think it's super interesting to see like how, I don't know, the idea of this introducing a little bit is for me it's interesting to know what you bring into this project because we pretty much get to know to the process a little bit. So I, I received these images, and for me, it's like kind of how you mix your, let's say, workstation. For you, the images are for also you? Yeah. new. I just dropped them today, so no. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's something like, I, I think I was talking with you. It's like a st workstation composition, which is completely looking different than mine. And then you have this setup, which is more or less how you perform, right? This is... Uh, uh, yeah, a setup from uh, from also a spatial sound system in Milano, uh, run by a Jesuit monks. There's a Jesuit monk who is totally into electronic music and into spatial sound. So he, they build it uh, this uh, uh, this fantastic concert hall, and you, they have like 40 speakers. It's like self-made, and you talk about Jesus and you talk about sound, and it's uh, it's very interesting. Guy. Okay. Change the sound. Is he part of it? The echo. Yeah, I I, uh, I made a, I think a Caldera from a, a baroque composer. I made a, made a version of his Passion of, of Christ. I, I made a deconstruction and reconstruction of it. Uh, and uh, uh, Giovanni, the, the the priest, came after the show to me and said like he really could feel that it was not only about electronic music, but about the, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost and the Trinity and Jesus. Maybe be because I'm raised up Catholic, maybe, I don't know, what, what subconscious uh, drove me. But uh, I mean, I, I was also raised in, I'm, I'm more in a Catholic city, and jumping quickly to my background, this is pretty much one of my <laughs> approach. That was uh, a smooth transition. That's a hard cut. <laughs> <laughs> I think we don't have to talk so much about it. Uh, yes, clouds, thoughts, future. I think someone is here, Marianne, was during this process. But this was actually also uh, not only uh, uh, a 3D. Um, yeah, we ended up doing a sculpture was an exhibition, in, in no? Poland, actually. But pretty much my, my, my background uh, is industrial science, so all of my projects have been born in some uh, CAD tools or 3D software. I kind of try to approach some certain reality in there and play with some ironic elements and then print it out, make some sculptures, do some installation. And like this one is a work in progress. So it's... That's cool. <laughs> it's, it's this year, probably. That's why it looks like... But it's drawn is like super old. This one and this one more or less related to the background a little bit. Clouds, storage. And before jumping why we or what, what kind of thing we have in common, this project also was talking about how we um, find some holes or digital souls in space. So it's, it was a 3D scan, uh, one of the galleries that I was exhibiting two, year, two years ago. And I was trying to give it a form to the dots that technically software delete or don't consider this in the space. So the, the lost dots in space are normally erased, so I was kind of taking the negative and the positive of one space and trying to represent that. Which is more or less something that uh, 
connect this and your latest release. For me, I think it's the moment that we kind of jump together in, in this project because from there we we found like a, a line between. We pretty much coming from the audiovisual background and performance, and this is the album that you released last year. Applied autonomy uh, yeah. on on Rasta. Yeah, I was I was uh, not stalking you, but I was like. I saw that that you do things different than other people uh, with uh, digital images, and even those uh, you have, like you work with all the ingredients everybody has. I could see a strong artistic language, so I was like following you. And then when my when the idea of my album came up, I uh, I thought this is the moment to contact you and ask you to do the artwork. I love it. <laughs> So for those who doesn't know, we have a very audiovisual background together, and I hope you realize the piece is all about. We we pretty much play together for the first time. So that was the day that we kind of get stressed and nervous together. Oh yeah, the and video no. which is pretty close to what we are doing right now. The dialogue of us was happening live during the performance. And for this piece, we have so much dialogue before during the process, which is technically uh, thinking a result. That's why you, you, you are here. So before jumping and you diving in it, this is, I, I, th I think is this what connects us for, for the beginning of this project. And I thought like, it would be nice to show you since the beginning because uh, for us, I think it's, uh, uh, it's nice to point it at the beginning. Yeah, I think uh, w what was interesting was that you have a, not same sense, but a kind of same sense uh, when it comes to materiality. Like sometimes using really raw material and like uh, raw cuts and uh, uh, um, uh, building objects, but in a very, f like, uh, not simple, but in a very, like, uh, uh, how do you say, wie sagt man das? Simple. Einfach, einfach klingt äh, schöner als simple, actually. <laughs> also äh, in, in eine einfache, äh, einfache Form äh, with, with a, like a, with a uh, clear, clear edge uh, to it. So I, I felt when I saw your virtual forms, I felt uh, very attractive, uh, attracted and very close to it uh, from the first second. Lukas, had you been working with sound before? I, I do music as well, but and somehow I, um, my, the music process in my composition is just coming after. So I compose for the visual elements, the, I work sometime in some visual exercise, and then when I see some potential in the images, I compose the music for it. So it's a completely maybe the opposite than you, I would say. And the only way that works in my mind, I think it's, uh, I need to compose after mm -hmm. the music for it. But I guess now that changed a bit because you were working so closely with I would love to start with, uh, at the same sound, time both, yeah. but I mm. can't, something like this. Mm. Um, but before we talk more about non-phase, um, I wanted to give a little architectural background on the piece, basically. Um, because what's special about it is that it was designed for a full dome, which is like inherent to planetariums. And you had your first premiere in Hamburg at the planetarium. Um, so I thought also now, because I got a new job <laughs> in architecture history, <laughs> it has infiltrated my brain already. So um, if you start the next uh, Next, slide. you just yeah. let me know when, because. Yeah. Um, so also part of this background is kind of to show you a bit what I also really liked about your work. So for me, it was a very, kind of generative starting point to think about things we can't totally know or comprehend. Um, and this is something that actually is also part of the mission of planetariums, which are trying to bring the sky and the universe that is kind of out of our physical reach, but also kind of outside the realm of our imagination into closer proximity. So you're going faster than me. <laughs> So um, you already saw kind of the first uh, mock-up for a planetarium here um, on the building of the uh, Zeiss factory. 
And when they tested this for the first time, I mean, the setup was kind of similar. It was a dome, and it caused, caused like a huge hype. I, I'll tell you when to continue. Um, <laughs> because so um, on, a, on a literal level, your piece is, of course, dealing with mathematical ideas that are given visual form and that engage with sound. Um, they can, however, like these objects, not um, be given any mass. So I don't know if you guys already know about this. We'll talk more about the nature of these kind of impossible digital objects. Um, which means that they can't really exist in our 3D reality, in our realm of perception. We can't really know them physically. And um, so, no, um, yeah, so this was 1925. And what I found interesting, kind of this relationship between your piece and the planetarium is that there's in both cases something visible, but something not quite physically um, part of our experience. Now the next slide. Um, so uh, the, this is actually the, the projector they used from, from the second planetarium that was built, which the first one was in Munich and this was the, the second time, which kind of looks like an alien also. So I, yeah, I think it's kind of amazing. Um, the planetariums were really quickly springing up all over the planet. And um, the fifth American planetarium was kind of special in our context because it introduced um, an innovation. The museum's technician introduced um, a coloring of the main stars and red and blue projection, pr uh, projectors to simulate sunset and sunrise. And in some ways, when I look at um, non-phase, it sometimes reminds me also of like a sunset, sunrise situation because of the light. So even um, going back to the architectural history, next. Next, okay. Yeah. Um, next. Yeah, so there's, um, if we go further back, there were some 18th century um, buildings that kind of uh, architecturally, you could say, foresaw the star-spangled domes of the planetariums. So this one is by Jean-Jacques Lequeux. Um, he's a kind of undervalued figure in architecture history because he turned mad. But before he did, he kind of produced a really outstanding body of um, paper architecture. And I thought this one was very interesting to show tonight because it's kind of the representation of a world, inside a world, under this kind of idea of the vastness of the universe, which is shown in the ceiling of stars. And next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, here, this is a work by a student of Le Queux, um, by the French architect Etienne Louis Boulet. Um, he outdid his teacher in the kind of vastness of a circular building. And um, this piece was called the Newton Cenotaph. He drew this perfect sphere, so like a spherical architectural volume. And um, I mean, Planetariums are always spherical, or they always have this dome. But what's interesting here is also Newton's legacy. There was a huge cult around him at the time, and this was kind of a place to also worship him. Um, Newton had made the universe kind of uh, rationally comprehensible, because now you could understand it as spheres that are following, being pulled by gravitational pulls. and um, he, this sphere is kind of part of this universe system. And um, the sphere itself is interesting in relation to gravity because it doesn't show any points where it's being pulled towards the ground. So that's interesting about this section, um, especially in the next slide, in, the next in, slide. The, yeah, in this night section. We just get a sense of this idea of trying to also make sense of the universe and this kind of vastness and the immensity and maybe also of things that we can't totally understand by trying to gather it inside a kind of theoretical building. Okay, next, please. Um, so um, then this. Um, uh, 
New the Newton Center of kind of combined art and science quite early on, which then brings me to this project, which I also just wanted to introduce as a kind of uh, foundation for our conversation maybe. So this was um, the Pepsi Pavilion at the Expo in the, of uh, 1970 in Osaka, which had as its theme, progress and harmony of mankind. Um, Pepsi had invited the group EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology, to come up with a program. So here, um, I mean, outside they built a kind of cloud, um, which is the opposite of the Newton Center Tower, where there were clouds at the bottom. I don't know if you saw them. But here you basically had um, a dome, which was mirrored. It was covered in um, aluminum coated mylar. Um, so when you entered through the tunnel, you ended up in this kind of, yeah, quite planetarium-like stru structure. Do you want to go to the next thing? Um, where, yeah, so this is kind of what that looked like. Next slide also. Um, so what's also really interesting about this group is that it was um, founded by an engineer who liked working with artists to make that kind of technological ideas <laughs> possible. Um, the founder was called Billy Kluver, and um, one of the founding members of EAT was um, Rauschenberg. And um, Kluver had been working um, before, working full-time on EAT with Bell, Lab um, Bell Laboratories, um, which is interesting because, next slide. This one. Yeah, Bell had actually been working on this satellite. Um, this was the, this is actually a picture of the Satellune Echo 2, which the Americans sent into space as a reply to the Sputnik. So this is the same material as the dome in the EAT pavilion, the Pepsi pavilion. So um, this brings us back <laughs> from outer space um, to, the, to, to our stage. But the Sp uh, Sputnik was smaller and yeah. m much more effective, I guess. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this was a passive pavilion, so it could only reflect uh, data. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very big, and Sputnik was small. Um, but although Sputnik was so small, you could basically see it from everywhere, which was uh, a huge problem at the time for the Americans. So they made this very big silver ball to kind of make up for their... Uh, being second, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think uh, this is just like a little introduction before we maybe talk more about the medium of this full dome. Um, I mean, a dome is obviously, I try to kind of show that the dome has a big history and allows a lot of kind of spatial experiences that are unique. But the full dome and trying to kind of make a projection for it must have been quite challenging at the beginning, right? So maybe you could talk a bit about getting to know this medium yeah. and also, yeah. Um, totally, I mean, the, the idea of working in an omnidirectional way visually is, mm. is, is very uh, challenging for, for, the, for the fact that you cannot um, skip elements from the horizon easily. So for me, visually, was when I was focusing on composing in a regular uh, aspect, like frontal aspect, uh, when I get to know the, let's say, the, the, the axis and everything that is related to my point of view, was pretty much like super uh, the money. It took me a while to understand, actually, like the setup of my tools and how to really see it in a, in a, in a big scale, because Actually, there's yeah, a have, picture yeah. like, like we have here, like it's actually to get to know the space mm -hmm. before, uh, to get to work to the space before. Maybe you should, a uh, quick note. So while they were working on the video projection and the sound, um, they could test it on this little mini dome that you see up there to kind of get a yeah. sense of how it works on a curved surface. Yeah, we right. spent a few weeks sometime over there. It was more like a hairdresser kind of thing. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was 
interesting that uh, you showed me the images in 2D uh, and I really like them and I thought I, I got what I, what I see, but when I saw them even in this little dome, the, uh, the image looked completely different. You had a, a total different feeling of, of uh, dimension and, uh, and uh, uh, um, like uh, how it spreads and how, how it how it moves it's really you can't you can't imagine it uh, in for, uh, in 2d it's like impossible it's like uh, i was uh, i thought like okay this is how it goes and then i saw it in this uh, microdome and i was completely surprised uh, and was it similar with the sound because i think in hamburg you had like 40 speakers and here uh, how does it actually work how do you get a sense of the kind of um Spatiality of the sound, like in a very kind of practical way. In a, I mean, every uh, spatial sound system is different. And in, uh, indeed, in Hamburg, we had in the dome uh, mm -hmm. included uh, a range of even more than 40 oh. speakers, so I could uh, let the sound uh, travel. Um, the movement of the of the sound changes the sound, so it's a, it's it's not a Doppler effect, but it's uh, it uh, it has a similar effect. So when you hear the sound moving through the fear, I think it's more because of the reflection of this uh, uh, of the sphere itself. Uh, sphere itself, the sound changes. So for me, it was I had to compose uh, uh, first the piece, and uh, we uh, we were very close when we composed both uh, visuals and, and sound together, so uh, Lucas was uh, strongly interacting, uh, uh, or was strongly uh, uh, talking to me about the music, and it was the same about the visuals. And from that, like, let's say from this stereo image, I was already thinking, uh, how, can, uh, how can this translate to uh, what uh, Lucas has in his mind when, when things are opening or closing. Yeah, so one thing I found super fascinating about how you talked about the objects also is, like, of course, I think those of you who have seen it, you'll all find that this is kind of duality that you have these really fleshy objects sometimes. They seem very kind of, yeah, seem to have like a real body. And then you realize that you're actually just looking at a surface or just like it's thinner than paper thin and you're kind of uh, like going through it and you're suddenly outside or on a different side of this um, object which suddenly loses all its kind of bodiness. And when we were talking about this last time, you described how you kind of composed also bodies because bodies reflect sound. So maybe you could talk a bit more about how you were imagining these um, spaces. I mean, it, it was a lot uh, uh, thinking about inside, outside. Uh, I, I think we talked about this too. I'd done a work for uh, Institut für Raumexperimente, uh, Olaf Eliasson in Addis Abeba. And I built a structure out of uh, wooden uh, beams, like a pyramid kind of thing. And uh, it was like a listening space. Uh, I had tea to offer. We had a tape deck. I was uh, playing a traditional artist music. Uh, what was interesting that uh, this was like just just beams, no, no, nothing around. And somebody came to me and said, "When I'm inside your structure, I feel warmer." It was like a cold night, mm -hmm. and he was like he had this like feeling that when he's inside my thing, he's like feels more cozy or something. And I, I found this very interesting. And then I was like trying to uh, translate this into um, into uh, an acoustic situation. So for non-phase, I, I was working a lot with uh, virtual acoustics. I was working uh, a lot with uh, uh, real spaces, uh, small spaces in bigger spaces, taking microphones out. So doing actually the same what uh, what uh, Lucas uh, does with the visuals, so he g gets out of a space, gets into another one, to, uh, g gets a reflection from the old space, but there's like a reflection from, a, from the inside space too, so I was trying to, um, maybe having a, a, a simple example, if you, if you pass a room like this room here, 
uh, you hear somebody inside talking, you hear the, the acoustic of the, of the inside room added to the acoustic of the room you are inside. So you have like two, you can, if, if, if this would be a small room, you could like hear those people talking in a small room, but I walk in a big hallway. So the, this, the, 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 the close reflections come outside to your ear and then mix with, with, your, uh, with your environment. So I was trying to recreate this, basically. Yeah, and actually, I have to admit that only after you had explained this, I started realizing when I heard the sound again, that it really affects how you perceive what, I mean, you're basically looking at textures, right, and shapes. But then also because of how sometimes the sound seems to, the sound source seems to move away as you're kind of zooming through these spaces, um, you perceive them more spatially. So there's a really close connection actually between this kind of illusion of a body or a space. And I mean, the whole thing is illusion because it's a yeah. illusions machine. I mean, it's yeah. like uh, the, the film's uh, 60 frames per second and it's not moving bec uh, b just because our uh, cognitive system can't uh, see every single picture. It thinks it's uh, so something moving. So what we experience is, uh, is a fundamental illusion. Oh. And speaking of illusion, nice. no, no. I just wanted to show. Like, I be, for me, it was super interesting to, to listen to our perception because when I, when I was showing to you like how I think things move and, and trying to explain him like how I imagine the sound traveling in space, I think uh, uh, I think the first encounter we have was not only the the way we're gonna translate, which was so, uh, some of the tools we're gonna use, but this is a video that actually. Uh, kind of was the first approach we have, was the, the mobile dome with I don't know how many speakers. So we're looking at the dome of the planetarium and the speakers, right? Yeah. It was in Hamburg, or, yeah, Hamburg. So, yeah, to make that it was like... Yeah, to make it clear for the for the people who work in the dome, they they project the position of the speakers. So each uh, each uh, circle w was uh, was a speaker. Mm. Yeah, and also like this one, I would love to ask you a little bit more. This picture of, of which one? Uh, this is uh, uh, Anil Ersalan, a famous uh, impro uh, cellist. Um, I met actually a, a Facebook uh, question asking for cellist because I didn't know any uh, uh, and uh, uh, loads of people uh, uh, came to me and said we want to work on this project and he was one and uh, Elif Dimley uh, was another uh, uh, cellist and I worked with both um, because uh, cello is a, also an interesting instrument when it comes to acoustic because it has some there's some certain uh, certain notes which gives like odd uh, reflections to, uh, to, uh, to the body and as a, as a player you have to be aware of it, you have to play kind of around these resonances and uh, what we did was like a very short uh, uh, like half an hour improvisation we were talking about like lifting, uh, lifting tones, short tones, uh, rough tones uh, drilling a hole in, in a cello is of course a crime but the cello, the cello was. Oh, oh, we don't have this, so show it. Uh, which one? The hole. The hole? Yeah. Is it there? Oh, it's there. Okay. Uh, th this was not Arnold's cello. The, uh, that's a cello I bought, which uh, was new Should but I broken. Should take it on now? And uh, I. Hmm? I thought I have to put it or not. Yeah. And uh, I was interested in how to uh, uh, again. Uh, uh, different acoustic spaces, so having a microphone in the cello in a small space, moving both outside uh, to a bigger space, moving the microphone out and understanding wh what kind of uh, uh, effects it has. So I, th I think pretty much was like the, di the dialogue we have in the beginning. We just face a new medium that offer like su super uh, different approach and for me in the beginning was something like if I really have to find a line and, or, or like, a, like a common di uh, technical dialogue or not with Robert to exchange what we, what, what we have uh, uh, think about the, the piece. 
I mean, part of this kind of illusion machine uh, is also the texture. I think the texture is really interesting because, uh, yeah, maybe you can tell us a bit about yeah, sure. the texture. Um, I think uh, if, if you want to know what is the, 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 the raw composition of this piece, it's pretty much, uh, I would say, like three elements. The, the, the whole objects that, that we create are naturally not having any color in the, on, on, on the 3D software. So they came just gray as the natural source. So if you 3D scan bodies or if you model something, um, naturally they don't have any color applied. So I kind of take this for, for as, as, a, as a statement. And the only colors you see on the piece, they are like technically lights. So if I turn off all the lights on this, uh, immersive space, you don't see anything. So everything that you have seen in the, like how the, 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 the floor is going below or like you, all the elements are being basically uh, having the light attached and they move through space. And the texture especially is the only thing I, I find uh, in common to all of them. So uh, for example, like I think it's this one. Um, yeah, it's technically like a uh, light sources, three light sources, which is given the, the color and the texture, which is looking different regarding the, the natural scale of the element. So sometimes you get super crispy, sometimes you get super big. Uh, sometimes it's looking like a paint, but it's yeah. the only thing they have in common and, and the whole composition. Yeah, and um, kind of what I was trying to get at, something we've talked about before, is that the texture really doesn't give away much scale. I mean, sometimes, uh, you do seem to zoom in on the texture and sometimes you zoom out, but um, something about this texture is that it could be skin really closely zoomed in or ripples like waves, so you don't really know what kind of a scale you're looking at, which I think ties in with the sound idea that you don't know where, how far the sound is coming from or is it coming from within the space that you're looking at or from beyond. So, yeah. And you you also mentioned that there's this um, that you're experimenting now with different resolutions. Ah uh, well, yeah. After the whole trip with Robert, we we came out like um, I mean si since we found like it's it has some very elemental uh, uh, things that that kind of give out bird this kind of uh, crispy uh, sometimes unnecessary sharpness. Mm -hmm. Because pretty much, let's say, my personal uh, research I'm doing through this piece is like, I don't think like, I mean, if, if you're going 8K, 50K, whatever resolution or the next one, I think we don't gonna find beauty anymore into those things. So for me, working in such a big resolution was kind of, with a very unique thing, with elemental uh, pieces were showing me uh, something different. So I, we, we zoom a lot on, onto this uh, uh, raw shapes. And, but that, that's my, my, probably my poetical uh, touch to it. I, I think it's as much crispy you became or as much deep you go to this, it's, it's, there will be something uh, um, probably not beauty anymore, which does, which the texture and somehow during the whole piece became a bit uh, distance or, mm. or, or metallic. Yeah. I, it's, it's pretty much like a, I, I see so many changes during the piece, the texture, which is, I didn't manipulate but, but at all. But can I ask something, how close could you get to, uh, could you zo zoom in into the texture? I know you can't do it now here because you, uh, it's not the software you're using, but is it like, would it be it in eternally sharp or how, how would it be sharper and sharper? Um, I mean, the, the like from after 8K <laughs> comes 12K and then I don't know. I mean, if we do it technically, uh, the, the, only, the only thing we're going to start to see is just like a, a re-representation of the, of, of the pixel, of the shininess, of, of, of this crispiness. Because what I'm working right now is like how, uh, it's not like re-rendering again in a higher resolution. It's just like uh, taking the, pure, the piece that it is and then expose every frame to, to multiply the resolution. And, and let's say uh, in a commercial software which uses AI to maximize, to enhance the, every pixel. So which, which I discovered is pretty much the same shape, 
but then you can s scroll a little bit more. You, 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 you forget the texture anymore. It's something like, I don't know, I, I would love to show you maybe after when we, I would well, zoom in <laughs> and then a little bit. Yeah, when you talk about the zooming in, um, so I'm really interested also in these digital point clouds. Um, and you were working with them. You showed one of your projects, which was kind of like a 3D scan, and then you get a point cloud. And um, I'm sure you all know, but it's kind of like a way of surveying or, yeah, measuring kind of reality. But then you don't get a surface object, you get a kind of point cloud. Um, and when you zoom in, you actually kind of zoom past the surface and you're never quite sure if you're in or outside. So this I find quite interesting because now you have a surface, you have a kind of face. Um, and maybe you can talk a bit also about this, what is the idea of, of a surface um, versus texture um, versus, versus kind of like an edge maybe? Because I think there's quite a lot of interesting kind of spatial imaginaries in that. Uh, yeah, sure. I, can, I think it, it would be interesting uh, uh, even to help myself to, to, to come with more sharp words. Uh, when I, for example, when, when we talk initially about these digital bodies, remember that we, when we become the surface and everything, uh, I was helping, I'm not really familiar with, I'm not really good friend with numbers, so I'm very visual guy. So I have to kind of dive around and kind of find some, uh, uh, yeah, visual elements that can help me to understand which, is, which, which surface will be the one that I'm kind of uh, skipping in this uh, element. Wait, when you say skipping, what do you mean? Ah, uh, yeah, be because actually, uh, let's say when you, are, when you are in the whole piece uh, facing all the elements, they don't have, um, actually that's the name, uh, where it came from, more or less, like they don't have the frontal face. So every element in, 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 in the space doesn't display the frontal element at all. So you always see like the inner part of it, which is technically more or less something like, like this. So let's say if, if we point in this element, the camera is over there, oh. and this uh, blue point, which already show me the, the simulation of the, of the dome. Mm -hmm. So if I use, for example, an easy shape like this one, the torus, which is, became more powerful because it get me into a big limbo, to, to not understand in, uh, shapes anymore. So I tried to recreate, so I was trying to recreate my own structures and, and, and see how far I can go with the layers or, 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 or get lost in, in this inner, uh, in-out part. So for example, like, uh, I, dis uh, I discovered moments that when you, when you exaggerate the bubble, what you, when you don't see it anymore um, 180 degrees, you virtually uh, expand a little bit more, then you start to fake this this visual uh, composition. You cannot see m more than 360, but and this dome gave me the possibility to inflate it a little bit more and kind of force the old elements to shape into the space. That's why it looks like the ceiling is here. And uh, beside that, like um, just to point, why I don't have the face? I, there was the moment that I was talking with Robert, like. Uh, we need to design a system that, that can give us the, the possibility to, to, f to leave some moments of freedom to those elements and find an abstract storytelling where the acoustic also can, can be part of, 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 of this emotional uh, 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 yeah. distance of it. So it's pretty much like layering elements and when, when they, they all don't have this uh, outside phase. So you always see, it's like seeing an egg always from the inner part. It doesn't matter the, the, the point, the, the, the viewpoint we are. You always see the center. So all the pieces are kind of skipping the frontal face, which is making us, in my opinion, more than translucent because you cannot hide elements anymore. Mm -hmm. You just need to fake the, the room all the time. So again, I think this, uh, what you just said, is like an interesting way of kind of thinking about you know, what is the meaning of a surface? So like, if, if you go back to minimal art, the surface also had a hugely important role, but there was a kind of idea of depth also attached to it. And what we have here is now like a completely 
non-bodied surface. So you actually go, once you kind of try and think the other side of a surface, the whole thing kind of disappears in a way, right? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, <laughs> so that I, I still don't understand so much the, 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 the mathematical uh, result, but visually for me it's... Sorry. Yeah. Visually for me it's... <laughs> uh, yeah, for me, I need graphics to, to, mm. to help myself to understand what's going on. But, uh, yeah. but I think Robert is pretty much uh, much solid in this, mm. in this background than, than me, especially about how we... I because wish. Because we, 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 we talk a lot about more than, than diving technical aspect about how uh, we conceive yeah. the piece. No, but I mean, a surface either reflects light, then we can see it, or it reflects sound, then we can hear. So... There's a kind of, uh, so, and we always, in, in order to do that, the surface has to have some kind of a thickness or some kind of a physicality, some kind of a yeah. mass, right? Or, or, uh, or kind of uh, uh, perspective we can understand and rely to. I mean, wh when you look at uh, uh, early Renaissance uh, paintings, when uh, they discovered the perspective, it was super immersive for the people. People were in shock to see a building in perspective, you know, and for me, uh, uh, this like this non-phase is. Uh, I mean, uh, you describe it as a, as a one step further. It's uh, uh, at one point, it's like taking like the game with perspectives and, uh, in a way, also like entertaining people with perspective and with extreme uh, views. You have uh, in the. Um, it was very popular in uh, late Renaissance, early Baroque uh, anamorphosen. So, uh, so uh, things you can see only, or you you need a you need a, a medium to show it because they like they're very distorted. And then maybe you could an explain what anamorphosen. Yeah, we have we have actually one picture here. I think it's this one. Yeah, that's a kind of a anamorphosis. So, this is like. It's basically like a game. So you have uh, on the left side you have a destructed uh, uh, picture. It only uh, f gets complete when you put uh, when you put a glass pyramid on top. I mean, that, uh, all uh, the uh, different kinds of uh, uh, this uh, uh, perspective games. But in, uh, when you look uh, onto the pyramid, you you get the whole picture. You see the the angel with the trumpet and uh, the Ehrenkranz. Uh, when you take it away, you just see the elements. Here's the arm uh, and so on, so on. And for me, it was uh, interesting that we, uh, uh, because it has such a long history, uh, um, also like uh, impressing people, like this immersive thing is uh, also kind of um, interesting, but it's also kind of always posing in a way. So you always try to do something more, uh, uh, more impressive, more immersive. So it's, it's like this endless game, a bit like capitalism, is like always like showing new things. A new burger is bigger than the last burger, or is more vegan, or something. So when uh, uh, we had a big uh, culture of immersive uh, things in the 19th century, like the cyclorama or the diorama, we had like. Pictures were like uh, th uh, 360 degrees, which were uh, traveled. Uh, one of them were traveling. There was one big one in Berlin uh, installed, I think, near Alexanderplatz. They had like a million uh, uh, spectators coming. So this was like a big, big thing. And uh, uh, the planetarium comes out of that tradition in a way. And we are very aware of it. And what we did in uh, in uh, in Hamburg, for example, I think we we, we played a bit with the illusions uh, illusion machine itself. So I I was like overdriving, kind of torturing the sound system. So I w I was overloading it. So you could actually hear the uh, you could hear the speakers working, and you could see the uh, the surface vibrating. So that that's the effect you sometimes see in hip hop videos when they want to <laughs> impress people like this like this vibration when the bass we comes. We can listen to the piece, by the way, now a little bit. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. talking yeah, about. This. He was going somewhere. I feel like. No, 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 no not far. <laughs> no, I was uh, 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 just that that we try to uh, to take this. Uh, this illusion machine 
as it is and uh, and uh, and uh, play w with the form itself we didn't want it to install a, a flashy uh, 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 moving 3d mm -hmm. installation uh, uh, with sound we wanted to actually question the whole uh, the whole immersive yeah. movement and i mean if you kind of uh, overuse the technical instruments and they start maybe acting not perfectly, then you also become aware of them as your illusion machine, right? Yeah, because then you feel the actual space, because what, uh, what uh, Lucas does a lot of time, that, uh, that you, you, can't, you don't know, are you inside, outside, yeah. are you small or big, what you're looking at, uh, is, are you moving, is the, f is the shape moving? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we then try to make somehow the planetarium as a building visible mm -hmm. by just giving it an acoustic uh, 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 impulse so it can reflect and it can be actually noticed uh, as a building mm -hmm. acoustically. Yeah. Okay, and now when we listen, we can I all listen out for Yeah, I propose something like, um, yeah. you send me two experts of the piece, I think we could just play it a little bit we scroll in a little bit of images. Actually, in an exhibition that Rover is, uh, we, we kind of develop new shapes of, of version of non face like out of the dome. So how the pieces will look if you don't look in this spherical thing and you look at it in, in, a, in a flat surface. Mm -hmm. So I will just play it a little bit. It's just uh, one minute, and then we just go through this uh, uh, new images we create. Uh, b before you play yes, it, yes. I have a question. <laughs> totally. Um, about this piece that we're going to listen to, maybe you can say something about how it was made so we can listen out for that. Is it a cello piece or a, do you know which one it is? Because I think it's quite fascinating to be a bit aware of what we're actually also listening yeah. to. Yeah, uh, I took, uh, I think it uh, is a lot based on, on, on a cello. It's a, uh, I, I took some reflections, like the deeper tones are reflections uh, of a room I, I recorded and uh, like the moving sounds, which sounds like liquid metal, are actually a cello, uh, a cello plate. And of course there are the real rooms, there are virtual rooms, there are uh, uh, reverbs uh, created by algorithms, there are reverbs built out of real rooms which are folded into software, so that like all these different kinds of angles to it. Should I play the one or the second one? Just go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, and after that we, we just kind of dissolve a little bit and maybe show a little bit of the process, the one. Oh, um, maybe two.
now that we have um, also looked at images again of these digital bodies, yes. um, I think two things could still be really interesting to talk about. One is um, that you show us what these bodies are, because you have, you've kind of showed them a bit already, right? Um, the, you mean the, um, how I build it and everything? Yeah, yeah I think when, we, when we've been talking about surface and how we mm -hmm. kind of unfold this uh, omnidirectional space, I showed some kind of videos in, in the background. And, um, and then how you communicate between the two of you and also with external, like you mentioned when you talked to the sound technician, yeah. um, how you kind of establish a choreography together with these objects that can't exist in physical space and sounds that are <laughs> kind of yeah. semi uh, real, semi uh, I virtual. Think, I, I don't know if we are on right on time right now or. I oh, think so, right? Or should but we... Maybe we can open and talk be, about be, the process. Because wise. Ali is leaving now? No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't know if... Ah, no, Ali. Uh, or <laughs> maybe uh, we can <laughs> open no, up to... But I pretty much it's, 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 it's interesting to talk about how, how the dialogue was in between. And it's, it's the, the way of how we communicate. Mm. And for example, this was the visual script we, we get after the the whole visual composition and how I came to Robert once and say like, this is how it looks in a square 2D situation mm -hmm. like this. And, and my, my challenge was how to talk with him without manipulating any technical thoughts, like, mm -hmm. like put this out down. So I, we kind of, I think we have different trips, like uh, I think, this was the day that I came to the studio with Johannes. I don't know if he's here. So I came one to the studio with mm -hmm. this drawing about how I feel the piece and son uh, sonically. Um, yeah, I, ha I had to make some notes about how I feel and the whole overall thing. And also how I was cutting because I, don't, I didn't know his software at all and mm -hmm. I didn't want to manipulate it at all. So just kind of keep more raw. I like the epic emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're still doubting about that. <laughs> uh, so I came up with this kind of uh, things around. And so I found myself like talking to Robert and, 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 and Johannes and telling like, oh, this is how I s uh, listen. It's still mm -hmm. in my brain, the piece. Mm -hmm. And that was Robert notes after. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, and that's, that's, that was okay. Coming back to the to the beginning, there was technically like two situations where we also printed out some uh, some stuff. Like, so I have to, yeah, I have, we have so to we do it. Yeah, you print it out. I, I, so there was a kind of uh, uh, we have to use some some channels in common, like printed and, and everything. But for me, it was crucial. Like I, I arrive into. There was a studio where we record with Johannes. So there was the day that I was, uh, Robert print this for me because I didn't print it. <laughs> and I made this video just to, to talk with them. And there was the day that I was pretty much. Me playing Bach, okay. Um, so the, the process okay, was so pretty much not uh, telling to, everyone what to do. It's just yeah. maybe transferring uh, uh, what I have on mind as much as I can. And you could only guess if you were talking about the same things or not. <laughs> but how you feel? I mean, I think we can start the question at the moment yeah, because it's pretty much yeah. like, I, I would love to know how you feel the situation at the same time. But I think, uh, see my, is around, not yet? Okay, but I think we can, uh, I have more questions on the fly, but feel free to ask anything because it's pretty much something that is internal for us that we can show you stuff at the same time, you can ask many questions. Like, this is like another session we have. Sounds like tango, a little bit. So there was a, potentially the day we met with you, Natalie, and there was the last day on the, on the, on the, on the last weekend, I guess. Yeah, the yeah that's the micro, micro dome, the test dome. I didn't realize it was like inflated. Yeah. 
Yeah, because it's a, it's a soft shape, you have to, you need a, a, a air pressure to, to hold it. So, if people have questions? Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty much what we are kind of opening the, the, the process and yeah, I try, we try hard to register everything we've been doing because we talk a lot and from talking to saving a file or <laughs> writing yeah. a paper, no, I was doing Yeah, I think we could also talk endlessly about how digital yeah. objects, we can like, we work with them, we talk about them, we imagine them, but there's always still something we don't totally... <laughs> yeah, but would be great no. to know, would be great to, to listen something. I think there was this final session, the final session we have, uh, uh, these are the speakers. What? What is going on? <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I have to stop it there. <laughs> so, yeah. Good, good no, uh, uh, the, the Himbeer Marmelade came from uh, Schinkel, it's a small place near Kiel where the, the uh, dome company has the, uh, they have the headquarter there. So we traveled there and made a second test in, in, in the dome. That's why we had to uh, cross a river, which is a famous canal, I think. Yeah, you know, you told me a bit, but no, I remember the name. But maybe um, now is the time also for yeah. questions. Feel, feel free. Also, if you have more questions, Robert to Natalie or. I would like to ask uh, how. I mean, you were talking about the edge and the thinness of the material and the the weight or the feeling the material has uh, the the thinness of the uh, of the of the bodies are infinite or it's just a mathematical form uh, there was so a part of the text that she was mentioning like there is a layer and there's a surface and the layer is not the same or, or um. i think i don't know where i am at the moment but <laughs> because i see them almost like razor blades when, when, they, when, they, uh, when they move towards me or uh, besides, I, I, I feel like really that there's no, there's no body, there's no material in those big, uh, in those big uh, forms. Yeah, but the interesting thing is that the razor blade has a thickness and here, and that's why I think the texture is so interesting because it suggests thickness by creating shadows and these kind of little crevices and mounds, but you know at the same time that it has no thickness, which is actually something that we can't really, or at least I don't know how you feel, but um, you can't really imagine something without thickness that is still visible. And then for me, the closest thing I can imagine is a kind of cloud, you know, like either a real cloud or a digital cloud, which doesn't have a thickness, but it has mass, which is actually the opposite. So I just think as a kind of um, starting point for, for like this, it's almost like a riddle <laughs> or like a, a game of um, imagination. That but also somehow real, because when you look at atomic structures and when you get closer into like into a surface of this uh, of this table, if you would like see the atom, the atom would look pretty empty. Like yeah. it would look, there would be loads of space around the exactly. atom. Exactly, there would and be space between, right? And here you. And have when you go inside the neutron or uh, the, the the kernel, then yeah. you have all, uh, again a huge space, and then it yeah. uh, comes to the strings, and the strings are, in the end, just uh, vibrations. So. Uh, but uh, for me, this uh, piece is also like translating uh, our existence. In a no, but in a that's way. what I find so fascinating because actually, if you, like you said, there's so much when you go into a surface on a kind of atomic level. But with a surface like the one that you work with, like a, 
a digital surface or like um, a rendering surface, there's no atoms. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's nothing. But electricity, at least. Yeah, acoustically, you can give the illusion of there being mm. something behind. So I think it's a really interesting thought. Like, mm. it, it kind of uh, makes you rethink um, the potential surfaces, which then uh, makes us rethink space. So, you know, we're back at architecture. <laughs> so, no questions from the audience? That's even better. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for joining awesome. us. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, vielen Dank.